Okay, second attempt. Hi guys, it's Eileen. Today is Tuesday, the 22nd of September 2020. Uh, I have me a second cup of coffee and I have got a couple of things I would like to, to tell you about. Um, since last time, um, we have been chopping, trying to chop off bits of the, um, of the maple tree chunks, you know the trunk that is uh, cut in sections in our backyard now. And um, it's working, it's slow work. And I only have like a smallish type of an axe head and a big uh, steel, I suppose, hammer, iron hammer to, uh, you know, wedge in, wedge the axe head in there. And then there's a longer type axe head about this size. Um, that's longer and narrower, but it hasn't been sharpened at all ever. So, it's it's possible, but it's also, you know, you get really sore in the shoulders from that type of work. So I think I've decided more or less to quit at this point. And I have, uh, of the 10 lumps that, are, that were out there, uh, I have six left, of which the sixth one is actually cut in half now. And that's the most important section. So we will be able to... Uh, enjoy all that in the fireplace uh, from probably from after the winter I don't know how long this will have to dry uh, the wood is still very fresh at this point of course uh, since the tree uh, got taken out um, last Friday so I'm actually rather happy that it's progressing I have been um, pleased also with the way my backyard looks without the maple tree it was really a massive the tree was actually bigger and <laughs> more it took up more space in a way that I was used to it but not having it, having it there anymore is actually completely fine to me my fig tree will have to adjust uh, slightly because there's you know on the side where the maple tree used to be the fig uh, doesn't really have any branches or leaves at that side only little ones and so there's a lot more daylight uh, also coming into the garden uh, in the morning which is completely fine I've actually I like it it's better this way than the way it was so I'm happy with that um, I spent quite a large portion of yesterday just getting actually lit my little barbecue uh, pot that I have uh, that I use for grilling, uh, you know, chicken bits on and stuff like that. Um, to get rid of some of the intermediary bits of sticks and leaves and stuff that was all over in my garden. So my whole yard was like completely cluttered up. I'm going to be waving my hands again because fruit flies and what have you. Um all over it was like almost impassable you know in my in my area and it looked a, a terrible mess and um, actually after I'm finished uh, talking to you guys here and reporting I will uh, go back out and go back to my simple little novel which is by Tony Hillerman I was going to show you this is one of the types of things that I've been reading this is the next one after one that I'm, I've read them like four or five times already and I inherited the whole lot of I don't know 15 or so copies of uh, of this writer this author uh, from my friend who had you know sort of come to the conclusion that she knew them by heart, by heart and so she bequeathed them to me and I enjoy them massively I am reading uh, it's called The People of Darkness by Tony Hillerman uh, right now so it's all about um, the Navajo reservation. It turns out that Tony Hillerman himself didn't really uh, know all that much about, but he's, I think he's a nice author. And yeah, so this is the type of stuff that I can read that doesn't involve my brain <laughs> in any particular way. Just like Agatha Christie, super, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you just have to let yourself read that type of stuff. So that's my plan for the rest of uh, most of the afternoon, I think, is to have a bath and then to be out yonder uh, with my book, I suppose, and drink more hot water. Because that's good for me. 
Um, the other thing, I'm trying to think here whether there was any more intel that I absolutely have to share with you. I, um, Jennifer Pearson did a series actually of four videos about where I am sort of the guinea pig to test out particular spreads on. That's awesome. Oh my God. I have watched two of those, the two episodes that are uh, linked to myself and my mother in a past life uh, type of a context and a soul contract type of a context. And I'm kind of wow about that because there's a lot that can be said and I will do separate a separate VR at least to the whole of the set potentially two different ones depending on how the other ones are I am going to leave uh, watching the other two videos that she made to tomorrow at least because I uh, I can't have more intel in here now it's just not happening I uh, took notes and from the two videos that I did watch this morning and I am particularly impressed as to there's a couple of things that are important to me to point out. So this is the art history tarot of past lives that she's using. It is a very appealing deck. Oh yes, I have been kind of, you know, drooling at the camera or at the at the YouTube each time I, I see that see that imagery coming, I go like, oh my god, you know. Um at the time I saw um, I suppose somebody did an unboxing of it at some point last year, in 2019, I think. Because it's been around for a little while. I, um, immediately felt like, okay, so I have to kind of be capable of in, in working on different levels simultaneously. I think that's really important with this deck in particular, it always it's always that way for tarot anyway. You have to sort of see things in levels, right? Where there's the actual practical, to some extent, uh, human situation that you're engaged in or your client or your querent or whatever they are is engaged in on the sort of grassroots kind of a level. And then there is another level where uh, you're talking symbols really and it's like for example in the spreads that Jennifer shared with me at this point and she will I hope I, I suppose publish them uh, for everybody to watch who uh, you know is into this kind of thing uh, at some point or other I have told her I've said that she could as far as I'm concerned it's completely fine um <laughs> anyway, the lover's card. That was the beginning of my sentence. She has the lover's card come up in relation f to me and my mother as to, uh, I think, a period of time at some point in the first of the two sessions. Anyway, it's the, it's the lover's card that sort of signifies the period of time that I, before this life, this one right here, shared with my mother. I do not have to have been in a lover's relationship with her in whatever form that would take, you know, uh, even though I'm not ruling it out completely. I um, haven't really thought about it that way ever because too complicated and you, you know, anyway. Um, it's just that I was going to take out my Marseille lover's card, which I have right here, if if everything is as I think it should be. And it isn't. So as I talk, I will look for the lover's card in here again. Um, I've had the lover's card come up a couple of times uh, for me in the past uh, couple of weeks even. So it's like there's a pattern there anyway. Um, I was... I was interested in looking at a few of those cards where actually the judgment card and <coughs> sorry the chariot and the devil here we have him 
um, are other examples of there being uh, like an, an indication that you are working with different levels of consciousness at your position that you are at, right? And many of the cards don't actually show that. Um, like an Empress card, for example, is just an Empress and there's a couple of attributes around her and she's in a in a particular uh, kind of a countryside or something. I'm trying to see whether I left the Leverus card, card out there somewhere. It doesn't look like it's, it's got to be in here. Um, and all the, you know, court cards are similar in the sense that there's just a figure doing something. If you compare the Judgment card and the Magician, for example, then there is an interaction going on even at this level between the people here in the sense that there are different people being aware of the same situation at the, at the same time, right? He's only ever really aware of himself. So that's the kind of difference I'm talking about. Here, there's a power relationship between the figure at the top and those at the bottom. And the same happens here. This is the kind of stuff that's bothered me for quite a while, that there is such a level of similarity between those um, between those particular cards. And in the Tower card, which is, an, of course, another obvious one, there isn't really a sense of any consciousness, other level of consciousness. That's my, that's my go-to idea here. The other level. Um, I'm going to leave this for now because I want to talk to you instead of just messing around with my cards the whole time. So, normal situation. Uh, tarot cards in particular or oracle or whatever it is that you're using. A symbolical, a symbolic layer, right? A, sim a symbol rich layer of thought that you can interpret and interweave even with the practical level of life or the thoughts that you're having, the emotions that you're having, the relationships that you're seeing, etc. and so on and so forth. In the case of the art history tarot for past lives, this whole setup is complicated to my, as I, as I work with this type of thing. I do not have the deck, by the way. I have not yet gotten around to purchasing it because it wasn't really on my uh, to get immediately, <laughs> to get my hands on ASAP list, you know. Uh, there were other things uh, that I needed to get done before that. Um, I'm seeing it to, you know, happen to me in the future. At some point it will, it will show itself to me, I think. But um, I'm also quite broke at the moment, what with the tree and all the rest of it. You know, <laughs> we spent so much money. Oh, it's nasty. Um, more complicated, more levels. Because you're saying that there's your symbolic layer at the top is actually... Um, it looks like you could say that the symbolic layer is splitting in two halves, really. Where there's an art history layer in the symbology, right? Where you have to sort of meander through that interpretation that's on your card. So, for example, in Jennifer's video, the first card she showed us about um, where my mum and I used to know each other before this life, the card shows the Middle East. It shows a picture of the desert and the Sphinx, so Egypt even, because Sphinxes, that's Egypt, that isn't really uh, to either side of, uh, of you know, Jerusalem or places like that. Um, I'm thinking now that um, you can interpret that on the symbolic level in a number of ways already. You can, so I'm trying to just sort of categorize here, if that's any use, I don't know. Um, what this particular card is, it's supposed to be, I think, if I remember correctly, 
it was the judgment card which is then imaged in this way as the Sphinx in the desert and named Middle East. So see, there's like three levels in there. The normal, <laughs> whatever normal is, you know, uh, tarot interpretation of judgment. And I'm supposed to look at this as a where thing. So a, an answer to where. I am, uh, I was always from the beginning with this deck very squeamish, I suppose, about assuming right away that what the card gives me is like an exact location or even a cultural location. I would like to take that, you know, in terms of interpretation, I would like to take that as widely as possible, always. Because I've actually got some past life experience where my mother wasn't involved. And it's very important to me. It has been very important to me. I've talked about this on my channel about soul retrieval a number of times already. And I should really do a soul retrieval visit, revisited video at one point because I think there's a whole lot of people out there who have never really gotten around to, uh, you know, hear me talk about this. And it's the most important thing that I've got to share, really. So there's that. And then I would say that this... So in the symbol layer, there's the art. The art... Um, <laughs> Oh God, I didn't turn off the sound. <laughs> Hang on a second. That's done. Okay, we can't be interrupted by any humming and booming noises anymore. So there's that. There's the art history. There's the interpretations of locations, of areas, which I think I'm not going to jump to. because If I get a card that has to do, that gives me an African setting, I am not going to jump to the conclusion that ergo... I was in an African setting. That's just going too quickly, too far. And it's so easy to fill in imagery that you have not got. Normally, you don't have access to past lives as they really were. And so there's the layer beneath the practical layer, I think, where I live, where you live, which has actually got a past life or several past lives connections in it. And so there's a whole lot of stuff going on there that I have that I think I, I would love to I would like to be really careful with um, assigning meaning or in what way to interpret you know any of it. I found it particularly useful in watching her videos to um, keep in mind the original uh, tarot significance of the card as well because that was kind of my frame my backbone to understand what it was that she was doing also to sort of separate out the tarot line of thought and the art history line of thought and the past lives line of thought it's a lot it's it's a big mix I think Jennifer did a super job you know just to <laughs> I mean, wow, to record four videos for little old me, that's um, just awesome. So I'm enjoying every second of this and um, wow, you know, I, I still hardly, I hardly, uh, <laughs> I can hardly believe it that somebody would be willing to on the other side of the ocean and so on and so forth, you know, wow. So I'm still looking for the dratted lover card because it's important. Where, where's the dratted card? It's playing hard to get now. There's the moon, there's the sun, the star. It looks like I haven't... Uh, either I have a blind spot, I've developed a blind spot. That's it. <laughs> For the lover's card. Because uh, I'm just going to keep messing around until I get it. Um, in the Marseille, right? This thing here that I keep using... This is the Marseille tarot deck, like that, a very familiar, very well known. Um, Justice, uh, Wheel of Fortune, it's another important one, 
It's a signal card that represents my mother at all times by now. The Wheel of Fortune. I must have put it somewhere else because it's not in here. You sure? Yes. Or either it got glued into the... It got glued into the box. Here we have the lovers. So... I should go into this in more detail in my proper VR to those two videos, and I will. Okay, so I'm just going to show this to you as a another one in the series of the Chariot and the Judgment and the Devil. And uh, there was one other one, I think, where you could really see levels of people being aware of a different level of consciousness. I think that's crucial to the whole of the past lives interpretation and especially for me as it has developed and what with my soul retrieval and everything else the way my life has sort of unfolded since then it has been um that my soul retrieval experience has been an a life changer that i'm still trying to deal with you know it actually sort of manifested most clearly uh, about five years ago and from then on I have been trying and working really hard to uh, work with that new energy. I have obtained, made contact at first and then Im integrated into myself this energy that used to belong to me, whatever that was. I have wondered and I have to do a lot more searching. I think you cannot... The, the, th the lesson that I have got and that I also get from Jennifer's videos is that there are um, that there are really these levels of consciousness inside you, around you, the way you live your life, the way you make your choices through your life, the way you go about things, everything is whenever things get really dramatic really painful especially for a very much longer period of time the need behind that as i have processed it as i've learned it also to some extent from my mother is that you learn to step out of your normal perception of life your whatever is normal for you to the extent that that's actually comfortable or possible even. And I think that that is why I am actually also on YouTube, why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. Because I, and I need to, actually watching those videos uh, today, has sort of reinforced for me this, um, the usefulness of all those years of travail, all those years of, not having a clue, basically, of what was going on. And um, making it in the future, in this channel, on the, in the future, more and more it will be about maintaining the composition of your life, if you like, with the addition of those different levels, if that makes any sense. So here I am. In the physical, I have a personal history in this body. I have a set of relationships in this body at this point, right? There are themes to my life that are larger, that are more dramatic and more painful and more, etc., long lasting than simply uh, short term, you know, bits and bobs. The more difficult it is, the more you are under a soul obligation, if you like. So soul, S-O-U-L, obligation to expand. To figure out how it is that you make contact with non-visible sides of yourself. From the physical outward, if you like. And then the game is to remain or regain balance, you know, to remain in balance or to regain balance, which is way more likely to 
be a possibility, you know, when things get weird or difficult. So each time you have to reel in the normal that applies to us, right? Not everybody else is normal because that's just like this level of normal. What we need is a this size level of normal. I'm actually making sense to myself here, at least. So you imagine this is a nine square uh, surface right here. So if you were doing a nine card spread and regular people who are, who didn't get the challenges that you did or that we did or that somebody did, you know, I'm not making this about you in any way, unless it is. That's your, uh, it's your shop, right? Then it's not sufficient to have a normalcy that applies, that works within one card. If you have all the other cards dancing around your brain, so to speak, you need a different kind of normal. But you need a, a, a level of normal that will work in all the circumstances. So you can deal in a hypersensitive situation in an empathic situation, in a situation where you are suddenly swamped by whatever kind of weird perception of the surroundings, like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, a haunted area, for example. We're nearly into Halloween, uh, you know, season, so hence. And it's a long road from the haunted perception, for example, just taking a random, silly kind of ish to me, less than completely obvious example, because I was never what Teal Swan calls a multi-sensory, I think. I think that's the word she uses about herself. I was the most um, uninterested, selfish. Uh, I think in terms of temperament, I tend to just basically let everybody else decide what they want. I have no fight inside me. And that's not because I'm too scared. It's because I'm too lazy. I do not see the point of fighting for anything. Um, there is fear that comes afterwards, of course. But I uh, don't do complicated stuff really well if you believe it. <laughs> I have learned, I've been made to learn. And the craziness between my parents and between myself and my parents and my mother and all the rest of it is actually a, um, it has been a 150 year long invitation to consider different levels simultaneously. So the nine positions if possible or even just six of those nine and the top row of three is still to be you know maybe as I do this maybe as I manage to find words for this type of stuff which I have to do all by myself right here <laughs> I and still keep smiling you know if possible yes thank you very much because that's one of the ways of of pulling back to oneself, right? Who am I kidding? How am I going to convey anything in the world out there if I am constantly like dead serious? It's not my MO anyway. I find that completely uncomfortable. People like you to be consistent. I am not because I have too much on my mind. So I try to be to return to consistent lines of thought and to return to the beginning of the sentence if possible if my brain is cooperating then you know this can all still work it can all still work including soul retrieval and past life it may take us a while for it to work for it to crystallize into something that you Go like, okay, so this actually makes multi-level sense. That's a nice one right there. So I have one more sip of coffee. And then I will move over to the last item on my witchy check-in list. Which is, I have a Thoth deck now. I don't know what happened to Natalia. 
all her videos are gone. She deleted, I, th I think she did herself, all her videos. At Ouroboros, you know, I was watching uh, her videos uh, quite regularly. And she's been gone for a year or so in uh, 19. And she came back in 2020. I just hope she's okay. If you're out there, you know, because I really liked her content a lot. She's a psycho psychologist who uh, uses tarot as a, as a tool in her practice also. And she brought my attention to the Alistair Crowley Thoth deck. So there's a little story behind this uh, nice little crocheted uh, package here. I spent, uh, I think, two or three weeks or so on and off spinning. And this is the thread, thread that comes out. Really neat multicolor thread, which is a bit harder to do than just plain white, which is just like spinning. I have a, a spinning wheel that I inherited, which is a fairly modern one, from my mother-in-law that she used to use back in the 70s. And I, uh, this is a nice bit over here with all the, all the yellow threads. I keep trying to block my face so you can actually get some detail, but I have no idea whether that actually works. See? <laughs> This is a very nice soft woolly uh, spinning thread, spun thread out of two threads that you have to twine together. And I actually finished that on Saturday, I think. And what with all the difficulties, I sometimes feel like, okay, so this is a... I did a similar uh, quantity, more or less, of wool where I had only red and a tiny bit of blue in it. Um... In 2018, I think it was, when we had an eclipse. I actually got up at five something, five o'clock in the morning to um, spin red and white during the actual lunar eclipse, you know. And I've been using that thread uh, for particular little magical purposes and just reserving it for purposes that I think were, uh, you know, special. So similarly, this actually has more of a hopeful quality to it. What with all the stress that we've been through, I felt that this is just uh, a really nice product to come out of that period. And then last Saturday, I got around to actually visiting, revisiting a shop, uh, which is the same shop that I got my Cabalistico Tarot and my Lord of the Rings tarot and one other deck uh, last year in 2019. And they have, it's like a stationery, large stationery and artist supplies shop in the middle of the country. So if you may imagine the Netherlands like this, it's more like to the west of it. We are down in the southeast and it is, this shop is halfway in a little town, halfway to my brother-in-law's home address, which we were where we were going and there's my husband has got a couple of clients in more or less the same neighborhood not close to the town where the shop is but the route you can choose between a couple of routes because you have to cross rivers in order to go northwest from here to that area that we were going to visit um, you actually have to cross the rivers either over here over there or on the on the completely on the west side you know more or less you have to decide up front <laughs> which uh, crossing you're going to use. So this town where the shop is actually has a ferry rather than a bridge and the sh town's real nice. It's an old, um, there's a history of silver smithy work, silver smith work, uh, like plate silver and, uh, you know, uh, plates and goblets and that kind of decorative uh, stuff uh, since uh, centuries, you know, in there. And it's old and cool and it's got, you know, a bit of market and a couple of coffee houses where you can have pie and people enjoy themselves over there, quite obviously. So the ferry is always quite rather busy. You have to um, park your car on the ferry with a couple of like a dozen or so other vehicles, a couple of people with bikes, a couple of passengers on foot. And as you trudge over the river, you know, which is kind of neat always because it doesn't happen often, you know, being in the car or by the car on the boat, you know, 
you get somebody who uh, asks you for your money, you know, to, it's like to a, two euros seventy or something to cross. So just one way. Take it. It's not really super cheap, but I suppose if you live close by, you would get a, like a pass that you only have to pay, like you, get, you pay a lot less. So the last time I visited this shop, um, which is also the last time I think we were in that town, actually, they said that they were going to, because it's really a big old, it's one of those big old um, location, shop locations where you can see that they have a corner shop, which has windows on the two sides of the corner, like so, and then the entrance is on, on one of those sides. And some of that has been quite, you know, it's been modernized to a certain extent. It looks like they do not necessarily always have enough people to keep the place completely clean. But they have a lot of the art supplies, canvases, uh, piles of canvases, piles of nice books, postcards and stuff like that. All that's in that front side of the of the shop. And that looks really neat and m m fairly fairly modern you know for that type of an area it looks uh, completely fine so to the side of this shop so along i think what used to be a canal at one point or it's a marketplace now it's a fairly wide street there is like a second uh what probably used to be a different shop altogether that they uh, the owner of the big shop actually bought at some point I suppose I'm supposing here and they just broke away a piece of wall in between and this older this it's it's uh, it's been part of the same enterprise for probably 40 or 50 years or so so if that little shop to the side was ever like a well, I don't know butchers or hairdressers or somebody um, that is at least 50 years ago I'm assuming they had the opportunity to buy uh, this extra bit of, uh, of you know, shopping real estate shop uh, surface right there. And they actually um, put more metaphysical materials in there. So they have a, somebody, I think probably the dad or people back a generation back in time, had an interest in crystals and minerals. There's quite a bit of that. There's amethyst, geodes fairly much all over the place in the in the shop and there is um i haven't really even looked because i was completely obsessed with my deck business right there i um have seen more other deck materials as in oracle decks and a bit more like maybe game related playing card type stuff you know that type of thing and some more creative crafty materials that's also in that corner so it's a separate little you have to know which way to walk you go right around the back uh behind the counter really off to the side and then all of a sudden you're in in the esoteric country more or less there's even a bit of incense and you know the the normal metaphysical type of stuff so i had gotten the last time i was there lengthy tail isn't it yeah uh, I just want to compensate also for the heaviness with the past lives and all that because, you know, balance and rootedness, you know. I have enjoyed working with this um, a ton, in, especially in recent times, because I have looked up almost every single card I've drawn at whichever point in my life or my husband, that's my, my husband's drawn or whatever, I've looked it up in here to get the astrological reference, imp most importantly. Also to get my teeth into this whole, um, I suppose, the growth history of the tarot as a thing. <laughs> How stupidly can you put it? Where there are fixed meanings to the 78, really. And it, to me, it seems more and more, this is my, my take on this whole thing here, that we are constantly, always, in tarot, whatever it is that we're using, talking about the same thing. Just to compare, 
uh, I have the Halloween tarot right here. So we have a two of wands here, which I had left over. This is just such a neat little, oh my God, I love this Halloween tarot. Here's the hermit as an Igor. You look at him. Everybody's seen this. Everybody loves this, I think. So this is kind of a Rider Waite type dealio here. If you were to look up any given card, let's say the Lovers, for example, in this one or in this one, you will get very different images, obviously. But the um, it all sort of rests at the basis on the same differences between the cards, right? There is like a, a current going through these cards where in order for the tarot to work, you need all these aspects and some of them are fire aspects and some of them are water aspects and so on and so forth. And this is how we have compartmentalized it. And it's a process, right? And actually each deck that comes out that is ever so slightly different from what we're used to, you're going to see um, kinship between the things. And it's endlessly fascinating and you can just, you know, spend your life <laughs> with cards, not the problem. So what I had seen was this on the shelf in that shop and I hadn't gotten it. Because I had the other ones, I had the Russian St. Petersburg also at the moment that I haven't used almost at all because I found it to be a bit um, less deeply instructive, certainly compared to this one. This has Kabbalah trees in it, you know, each card has a Kabbalah tree like so. It's not really very arty to look at, it's, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a ton of, um, here is the High Priestess with the Moon and a Hebrew letter and so on. I have a bit of Hebrew-ish heritage in my blood that also, you know, draws me very strongly to this uh, this Kabbalah kind of a side of things. I'm also an astrologer, so the astrological intel is important to me. And it just, I have used astrology to understand tarot, simply put. So the astrological stuff is not obvious from uh that this type of deck at all anymore because it's based on it's basically a rider weight clone in one way or another some of them are um you know still quite original you can still be you can be a clone and still be very original apparently so I'm not sure. I think there's actually astrological signs in here. Yes, it is. There's the emperor in the Halloween. And there's the Aries sign. Can you see? Right there at the bottom. And this is the front. It happens to be the front of the package with the Aries sign right there. I gotta have me some more water because I'm getting actually getting hoarse here. Yes, so I have done a tiny bit of hydrating. Um... I had seen the Thoth deck, spotted it, and it's the smaller edition. It turns out there's also a larger one, which I think will also be thicker than this set. And I hadn't really thought about it, whether it was going to be a smaller or a larger edition. Doesn't matter. This is the one that I found. The thing is that I saw Natalia over at Ouroboros uh, discussing this deck. She has a firm preference for this deck over um, Rider Waite style uh, decks because this actually has, I think that's those are my words, uh, what she likes is that this imagery is, um, it may be a bit more mysterious than the Rider Waite imagery and a bit, a bit less easy to at first glance uh, pick up on but it connects with the tarot history uh, more obviously. So it's really a useful deck to have a look at anyway. So I watched Natalia in the spring, you know, come out again and talk about this. And um, 
I actually mentioned to her that I had seen a copy of this and on the internet they're 25 euros and I just don't have the money anymore at the moment. Um, so I said to her, I've seen a copy of it uh, quite cheap and I can, uh, you know, oh yeah, let me know how you get along and see, uh, you know, so. And here I come, here I have it <laughs> and she's gone. <laughs> so I can't talk to her about this anymore unless you just happen to watch this, Natalia. I'm just hoping she's okay. Um, I have played a bit with this deck. I've only got it like for a couple of days. I have done a rather neat, I think, edging job on the deck. It has a little white book, like so. It is a, uh, it has a bit of historical intel as well. And it's the A.G. Muller Swiss edition. Cardstock is nice but thin. So it's they're sturdy cards. They uh, picked up the edging really well, I think. And it turns out that I find this a lot more mellow and friendly, if those are you know the correct terms, to connect to, to connect with, than I expected. I expected it. I will develop it. I suppose that what I'm saying here is that it is. Um, there's absolutely no reason to not have a go at this at this deck. To me, it was uh, kind of doubtful. You can see the backs very well known. Um, I was I was put off by Alistair Crowley and his whole you know the way he went about things. I just didn't know what to uh, what to think of it. I am not into ceremonial magic, as into uh, making. You know, I do. I don't. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to formulate all sorts of things at the same time here. Everybody has seen this deck, or you can you know shop around easily enough on YouTube to uh you know get a proper view of these cards if you want to that's uh, that's not hard you just put in thoth tarot and you get as many unboxings as you can handle it turns out that it is simply another atmosphere of a deck and it is a lot less uh of this and it is more it is more geometry, which makes it, there's a nine of swords, um, more subtle in a way. There's more, uh, there's a lot of cards that actually have uh, quite a bit of, um, yeah, there's, the, the cards are very dynamic, also quite geometrical. So these would be geometrical cards, and this is an, a very dynamic type card. That's the star card. This is a a Dutch edition, of course. That I, that's what I got. I didn't have a choice. This was the one. I'd actually telephoned. I'd sent an email, to which I got no response. I telephoned a week later, to this guy in the shop to ask him about whether he still had this deck, you know, and whether maybe they'd be willing to send it to me. And he said that he, the, that he didn't see it anymore, that it was gone. I got around to actually going myself to the shop. And yeah, there it was, of course. So this is a good, good example. The High Priestess of the... Uh, didn't I show you that one just now? Of the level of ge geometrical... So I'm... Um, I'm thinking... That what put me off at first was like a uh, li li the Alistair Crowley mojo of putting himself up like a posture of a magician and a priest and, and all that stuff. I'm not into that. Not in the slightest. However, this is still very much a tarot. And I can use that. I can work with that. I can incorporated in whatever it is that I'm doing so I've made myself a neat little pouch I even had a uh, can you see that 
a button that has like these circles on it which is like a quite a vintagey that's what I like also about this deck is they're very well drawn the colors are really well printed the detail is excellent so you get a complete visual experience with this it's like handling the artwork itself almost and uh, the artist um, had obviously she was talented she knew uh, in terms of human anatomy what she was doing um, she was happy making those cards I think there was more plus I think she she and Alistair did this work towards the end of their lives so maybe even during the Second World War or slightly afterwards so uh, but they were however both of them they were born in the 19th century in the Victorian age so in terms of what the cards look like the actual imagery um, it's post-Victorian there's Art Deco type Art Nouveau type elements in it in certain dynamic styles of expression expressiveness um, the geometrical uh, lines and spatial lines you know that you're given that looks almost like a like a type of a crystallization happening especially in the swords suit you get uh, quite a bit of that um i think those are again a different art style uh, a drawing style that harks back to early 20th century art mm, it endearingly old school vintagey to me and as people who learn most of their preferences and the way they you know how they look at art and how they draw and how they express themselves as they are young you know when they are really young still both of these people who were responsible for this imagery were actually learning their stuff still in the 19th century and i can see that i can see there's there's designs here that remind me of um glasswork from that period and um it would be interesting to compare in terms of draw draftsmanship and drawing style this to alphonse Muchat, the Muchat tarot which is a completely different kettle of fish. The imagery of that deck is actually never was never intended to be a tarot, was never intended to be metaphysical in any way. There were advertising posters that have been revamped into a tarot deck. So I've always thought it was really appealing, and there's an itch inside me for the Musha deck, which I do not need. I do not need the Musha deck. I do not need it. <laughs> I just go on at myself like that the whole time. But it's aesthetic, it's aesthetic, it's aesthetic, it's beautiful. And of course, the drawings are like completely excellent and beautifully made. And the, you know, layering of colors and bleh. so, yeah. These cards actually also have quite a bit of depth because the colors are just right. And this is just a really good job. So I have found so far that picking a few cards, I have actually used it to actually draw from as well where I tend to basically whenever I'm in dire straits I will just use my Marseille and then go to the Cabalistico for the astrological intel and that will provide me with just enough to go on to you know <laughs> figure out a shred of my life at least I pretend to myself that that's the case however all the other decks are here to just um, by now I can feel more reassured, more sure of myself, more confident and more comfortable and things are coming, uh, you know, things are passing and troubles are passing and it turns out that it doesn't last the rest of your life. None of, none of it ever really does, we hope, right? 
it, it doesn't, uh, the trouble with my neighbors hasn't determined all of my life except for the past four months. <laughs> so yeah, so there you go. So that was hard. It was very hard to live with, to, uh, to have to uh, constantly be, uh, you know, walking on eggshells and feeling like you were walking on eggshells and it was never enough. And my husband has picked up quite a lot of that vibration. I have um, done an immense lot of thinking, I think, and realized there's been a part of the process to me which was really about connecting with my grandmother on my mom's side as well, understanding her personality so that it illustrates how my mother behaved unconsciously towards me, which explains such a big load of, of stuff. Somebody should have told me that stuff, you know, like, oh, you should have known. It's not happening. You have to figure it all out by yourself. And there's another element in the general, you know, layers of consciousness type of a nine card type of a thing is that the more cards you're dealt and the more complicated it is, I'm afraid the more you are more or less left to your own devices and more or less screwed because the only one who's going to figure it out is you. So yeah, am I actually almost an hour in? Yes, I am. I'm going to quit right here because this will take an age and a half to upload as it is. Thank you for watching. Love you to pieces. I hope you're okay. I am going to, uh, to buckle it up before I hit the hour mark, okay? Because, yowzer. So, happy times, okay? Better times. And, uh, and autumn is on its way by now. See you next time. See you soon. Ciao.